go into the world and tell every man that you meet there is a man on the cross a catholic take what you need to know right now a bold synthesis of inspiration and information keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous catholic perspective a Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and it's great to be on with you. The end times, end times prophecies, the French Revolution. Is there a connection there? And what could that be? We've invited back Xavier Reyes Hall to be on the program again. You might remember him. He's, he was on a few months back, I think back in 2023. We had some great conversations with him about his book, The uh, Revelations, The Hidden Secret Messages and Prophecies of the Blessed Virgin Mary. But I today want to focus on the French Revolution. Could it be that the prophecies will finally put an end to the French Revolution? And maybe, just maybe, that French Revolution is a little bit more involved than we've ever given it credit for. Hmm, maybe, just maybe. We'll talk about that at 30 past the hour, Xavier Reyes Ahal. Also on the program, I did see lots of stories in the news that were very concerning to me. One was, you know, the Vatican abuse expert. He's basically advocating for priestly celibacy to be tossed out. I have talked about this already on the show, but uh, this kind of triggered me today. But then I saw a video come out by Robert Nugent, for our friend from Ireland, who's been on the program a couple of times. He says something that I think made me think a little bit today. Could it be? Could it be that I, personally, but Catholic media in general, is just stirring the pot of division rather than doing something good? And when we discuss these stories of scandal, which I do all the time, as you know. So I want to talk about that a little bit at 14 past the hour. Uh, Maybe uh, maybe a little bit of both of those stories all together coming up in a monologue. So do stick around for that. Other stories that are hitting the news this morning, Islamic Fulani Muslim militias yesterday attacked and kidnapped a bus filled with Christian kids. Now they're missing. We don't know where they are. Let's pray for their safe return. In Nicaragua, the hits don't stop coming there because the Ortega regime is now desecrating tabernacles and stealing consecrated hosts. Why? I don't know. But you might remember Ortega's wife is into witchcraft. So let's pray for the deliverance of of the people of Nicaragua from the satanic oppression that they're currently in, uh, in, you know, experiencing. So lots to cover today, of course. We will share all and everything in the show notes over at thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Let's pray. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection implored thy help or sought thine intercession, was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O mother of the word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now your saint of the day. Saint John Bosco, pray for us. Giovanni Melchiore Bosco was born in 1815 to a poor Italian family and lost his father at the age of two. A hard-working, witty, pious boy who often recited memorized homilies to his friends, he entered the seminary when he was 20. After his ordination several years later, Father Bosco, or Don Bosco as he is affectionately known, served in the city of Turin, where he began to devote his efforts to caring for the youth. Many of his early attempts to organize young boys met with stiff opposition, from local communities, politicians, and even clerics, due to concerns over everything from noise to alleged potential revolutionary tendencies. But through prayer and perseverance, Don Bosco finally succeeded in formally establishing a teaching order, the Society of St. Francis de Sales, or the Salesians of Don Bosco. Their monthly publication, the Salesian Bulletin, has been in print without interruption since 1877. An accompanying order of Salesian sisters was also founded, with the help of their first superior, St. Maria Domenica Mazzarello, along with a third order for laity. All three orders maintain an influential presence worldwide to this day. Don Bosco was deeply devoted to Our Lady Help of Christians, and built a basilica with that title in Turin near his home for boys. 
Among his excellent writings were biographies of his mentor, St. Joseph Cafasso, and a student, St. Dominic Savio, whose canonization was due in large part to Don Bosco's first-hand testimony. Don Bosco died in the year of our Lord, 1888, and is hailed as a patron of Catholic publishers, apprentices, illusionists, or stage magicians, students, and the youth in general. St. John Bosco, pray for us. And now your headline news. CNA reports Catholic University fires professor who hosted abortion doula in class. We talked about this just yesterday. The Catholic University of America has dismissed a psychology professor, Melissa Goldberg, for bringing an abortion advocate to class to speak to her students. An email from the school's president, Peter Kilpatrick, said that the school began an investigation last week after learning of reports of an abortion advocate being invited to class. The president said the school also learned that a student had an an audio recording of the class in question, quote, Now that we have clear evidence that the content of the class did not align with our mission and identity, we have now terminated our contract with the professor who invited the speaker, close quote, Kilpatrick wrote. Goldberg's faculty page was no longer available on the university website as of yesterday afternoon. The Daily Wire reports Corey Bush faces DOJ criminal probe. The Department of Justice is investigating Rep. Corey Bush, a Democrat from Missouri, a member of the leftist squad and defund the police advocate for allegedly misspending funds meant for personal security. Sources reported that a subpoena for records announced in the in the House of Monday, House on Monday, was connected to a criminal probe into Bush. The inquiry is looking at issues related to her member representation allowance. Bush released a statement that said she can, quote, confirm, close quote, that the DOJ is reviewing her campaign's spending on security services. Quote, we are fully cooperating in the investigation, close quote, she added. And the Post Millennial is reporting Christian vet who beheaded satanic statue at Iowa Capitol charged with hate crime. Michael Cassidy has been charged with a hate crime for beheading a statue of Satan at the Iowa Capitol. Cassidy drove up to the uh, Iowa Capitol after the satanic display was erected there and took it down. He will be arraigned on February the 15th. And Polk County prosecutors charged Cassidy with felony third degree criminal mischief, saying that he acted, quote, in violation uh, of individual rights, close quote, under Iowa's hate crime statute. Cassidy had been charged with a misdemeanor fourth-degree criminal mischief the day after the beheading, but has been informed that he may be liable for further charges. Why aren't they giving him a parade, is my question. At any rate, those those are your headline news. Praise be to God. The gospel today comes to us from Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Jesus departed from there and came to his native place, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. They said, Where did this man get all this? What kind of wisdom has been given him? What mighty deeds are wrought by his hands? Is not the carpenter? Is he not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his native place and among his own kin and in his own house. So he was not able to perform any mighty deed there, apart from curing a few sick people by laying hands on them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Hadock's Catholic Bible Commentary today said, After the miracles that Christ had performed, though he was not ignorant how much they despised him, yet that there might be no excuse for their disbelief, he he condescended to return to them. They were scandalized at his lowly birth and humble parentage. Hence, Jesus Christ takes occasion to expose the malice and envy of the Jews in refusing him and to show that the Gentiles would more esteem him. Number one, just let's just realize for a second that when Jesus, I mean, Jesus is not dumb. Okay, he's God. So he knows how much we despise him. 
Let that sink in for a second. You can't hide in the shadows. You're not going to get it. None of I don't get away with it. You're not going to get Nobody gets away with it, okay? 100% of all of us get judged and get what we deserve in the end. Do not be mistaken on this point. If you despise God in your heart, he knows. He knows. The good news is you have breath in your lungs and you have a thought in your head and you can take an action on that and you can repent, right? You can, re- you can reconcile. You can go to confession and hear the words of Christ say, I absolve you. So what a gift. What an opportunity you and I have today because God knows how much we despise him. Let that sink in. What was that like to look into the eyes of the God-man knowing that he despises you? Whew, but yet he still comes. He still comes in spite of it all. A Cornelius Alapade, the, the great uh, scripture scholar, says, and he could not do any miracles there. Could not, i.e. would not, because he did not think it proper to give what was holy to dogs, that is, to force his miracles upon unbelieving and ungrateful citizens. So could not is used for would not. Because, says Victor of Antioch on this passage, two things must coincide for the attaining of health, namely the faith of those who need healing and the power of him who will heal. Therefore, if either of these be wanting, the blessing of a cure will not readily be attained. you got to have faith. But I would also say that faith must be completely aligned with God's holy will. When you pray, pray for God's will to be done. Pray to align your heart with God's and accept whatever comes as though it comes directly from the hand of God, as though it is God's holy will, whatever it may be. Because that is the secret of the saints, especially in the end times. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. More coming up next. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Tick, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McClain. It is so good to be on with you. Coming up at uh, 30 past the hour, we're going to have a great conversation. Xavier reyes Aral is back on the show. He has a book that we talked about in 2023 called Revelations, The Hidden Secret Messages and Prophecies of the Blessed Virgin Mary. I want to get his take, especially as a uh, French citizen, born and raised in France, lives now in the United States. But I want to get his take on the French Revolution and prophecy because, you know, I've been going through another book I found from Tan back in, I don't know, 1970-something, it came out, and there is just a lot of information in there, a lot of private prophecies that are specific to the French Revolution. Is the French Revolution still alive and well in corrupting mankind, and will the end times bring its final conclusion? We're going to get his take on that coming up at 30 past. Do join us if you can. I'm talking great French monarchs are on the horizon, at least that's what it seems like. Again, Xavier is coming up. We'll talk about it. I saw this story, and I did bring this story up. I I don't know, Producer Jake, when did we talk about this? Maybe a couple of weeks ago now. So it's not a news story, but the National Catholic Distorter, I mean, reporter, excuse me, a little Freudian slip there. The National Catholic Reporter has uh, reported on this very, you know, recently, says exclusive. Vatican's abuse expert says sending priestly celibacy could prevent a double life. And it triggered me because... You know, I wrote a book on how to overcome pornography addiction because I myself was addicted to pornography and I share the technique that works 100% of the time you use it every time guaranteed success rates and it's not even new. I stole 100% of the ideas from more smarter people. So here's what gets me about the story. And I was going to rant on this for a good solid 10 to 12 minutes. I'll just say, I'll give you the cliff notes. We are not obligated to give in to our lustful desires. That's it. That's all you get. That's all you need. That's all you need. You are not obligated simply because you feel something to have to act on that feeling. I'm, I mean, I, every time I pass by, like say a, a Burger King and boy, oh boy, that blue cheese bacon burger. Oh yes. I got to have two or three or 10. You know what I'm saying? Cause I feel hungry. I must therefore eat. No, 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 you don't. You don't have to eat just because every time you feel hungry. You don't have to drink just because you feel thirsty. You don't have to act on any sort of emotion or or sort of, uh, you know, response of dopamine in your brain simply because it, it is happening to you. The same thing goes for sexual relations, 
Simply because you have an attraction does not therefore mean you must act on it. As though you're somehow a slave to it. As though you can't even help yourself. That because you have these inclinations, you must therefore do something about it. Like, say, abuse other people, whether they be children or adults, say adult male seminaries, which is the vast majority of the cases that we're dealing with in the priest sex abuse scandal. But if we were to simply allow for these men to have access to another human being, a spouse, preferably a female, because that would be the only natural and, of course, God designed, you know, mode of marriage between a man and a woman only. But nonetheless, just because we were to allow this, does that mean that that person, that priest, would therefore be cured of their disordered inclinations? No, of course not. It just means now that they may abuse that person that they are sacramentally married to. So although it is possible to be a priest and to be married, as we see in the East, for instance, or the Anglican Ordinariate, as other cases may give us, but nonetheless, it's simply, what are the, what's the word? I know the word I want to use, but I won't use it. I'll be kinder than that. To prevent a double life, all the priest must do is say no to their disordered passions and pray and fast and do penance and, and have some discipline about them. And if they want my book, let me know. It's super, super simple to read, easy. Just You can read it even in a day if you had to. And it works 100% of the time. Just have them call me. But then I saw this clip from Robert Nugent out of uh, Determined to be Catholic YouTube channel. He's been on the program a few times. I want to play at least a portion of this clip for you. I'll link to it in the show notes because I think Robert brings up a great point. And here's the question. Am I causing division within the church? Am I a tool for Satan because I talk about these scandals in the church? Fiducia supplicans is something I've, I've hit on oh, quite a lot recently. The African bishops, you know, basically pushing back, leading the cause, because they were the only ones with, say, I don't know, spinal fortitude. Where were the other bishops' conferences to defend their people, to, to defend truth itself is the question in my mind. But nonetheless, I have talked quite a bit about Fiducia Supicans, Cardinal Fernandez, the scandals in the church, even His Holiness Pope Francis on many, many, many occasions. Am I part of the problem versus the solution? Therein lies the question. Let's see what Robert says. Some employees of the Irish bishops have contacted me regarding what is happening with Irish bishops this week in Oc, um, and I presume this, this story has been leaked to me so that I can blog about it. I went to prayer because if I don't mention this, people will say, oh, that I'm siding with the Irish bishops. But if I do blog about this, I'll be accused of confusion, of division and so forth. So I went to prayer and I asked our Lord, what should I do with this story? And our Lord said to me, don't be an agent of Satan. So I said, OK, uh, that's very clear. It's a, it's a serious concern when you do this type of work. You wonder, because there's nothing worse than feeling like you're a, you've are you become a tool of manipulation, right? The goal isn't to be a tool of a manipulation for anybody, not the devil, and certainly not bad actors within the church or in society itself. So I would argue many people that sit in our chair, talk to mics just like this, they think about this all the time. Let's listen. Don't be an agent of Satan. What does Satan do? He divides. He causes confusion. He causes hatred and so forth. So the, the only image that was coming to my mind was the message of Our Lady. And I'm just going to read you out the message of Our Lady. And this is a message fully approved by the Catholic Church to the Irish. So let me just set this up real quick. So there was a meeting of bishops in Ireland and staffers leaked information to Robert so that he can make it public. Presumably, we don't know. We don't know the information. We don't know what they're discussing. But presumably, whatever was being discussed at this meeting is no bueno. It is no good. It is not good for Holy Mother Church. It might cause greater scandal within the church and division within the church. And they wanted that to be public. They thought Robert could make that public. What is his response? But Our Lady of Akita. Irish bishops. That's it. So I'm going to leave it there. October 13th, 1973. My dear daughter, listen well to what I have to say to you. You will inform your superior. As I told you, if, 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 if men do not repent and better themselves, the Father will inflict terrible punishment on all humanity. It will be a punishment greater than the deluge, such as one will never seen before. Fire will fall from the sky and wipe out a great part of humanity. The good as well as, well as the bad, sparing neither priests nor faithful. Survivors will find themselves so desolate they will envy the dead. The only arms which will remain for you will be the rosary and the sign left by my son. Each day, recite the prayers of the rosary. With the rosary, pray for bishops, 
for the Pope, for bishops and priests. The work of the devil will infiltrate into the church in such a way that one will see cardinals opposing cardinals, bishops opposing bishops, and priests who venerate me will be scorned and opposed by their converse, churches and altars sacked. The church will be full of those who accept compromises, and the demon will press many priests and consecrated souls to leave the service of the Lord. The demon will be especially implacable against souls consecrated to God. The thought of the loss of so many souls is a cause of my sadness. If sins increase in number and gravity, there will no longer be pardon for them. With courage, speak to your superior. He will know how to encourage each one of you to pray and to accomplish works of reparation. It is Bishop Ito who directs your community. And she smiled and then said, You have something to ask. Today is the last time I will speak to you with a living voice. From now on, you will obey the one sent to you and your superior. Pray very much the prayers of the rosary. I alone am able still to save you from the calamities which approach. Those who place their confidence in me will be saved. So the people that have contacted me regarding what's happening with the Irish bishops this week, my, my thoughts and prayer is, the faith is a ruler. It is, it is a guiding post. You know, we don't attack bishops. We defend the faith. And Amen. Exactly. Well said. We're going to link to this in the show notes so that you can see it for yourself. But here is the kicker. Here's the kicker. We call we talk about the scandals in the church because we need to shine the light of Christ into the dark spaces. And the cockroaches need to feel like they are not at home. Do you see what I'm saying? We cannot just stand by and say and do nothing. The question is, what do we do? We raise awareness out of love for Holy Mother Church. We defend truth itself in the face of error because the reality is tick, tick, tick. Time is fleeting and death is coming. And in death for you, for me, and for the whole world, we will find judgment. Judgment for everything that you and I did because God is not dumb. He will not be mocked. He knows how much you despise him and how much I despise him. He sees our sins, our hard-heartedness, our lack of repentance, our lack of forgiveness, and he will judge us. So time is of the essence for us. We must do the right things at the right time. We must have courage and boldness, but we also must have some charity. What do I mean by that? Well, if we're going to sit here and proclaim the truth and call out the scandals, the wolves and the Holy Mother Church, then we must also do the other thing. That other thing is to pray, to fast, to do penance. Are we on our knees? Are you on your knees? Do you pray? Do you fast to do penance for the bishops every single night? I know we do as a family. It is a part of our nightly prayers as a family to pray for the church, to pray for those bishops, those priests that have to deal with the, these issues in these dark and difficult times. Because again, as the prophecies make very, very clear, Akita being the, you know, a church approved one, you don't even have to question it. It's just totally approved above board. It is incredibly clear that in the end, heresy scandals will be taught from the highest levels and many souls will be led astray. Let me give you an example of what I mean by this. I saw over at the pillar that this story, Belgian church official warns of the previous bishop case, uh, uh, Van, Van Louis. I don't even know how to say the man's name. He's now passed on, and his successor is now passed on too. But this Van Louis guy, this bishop, he molested two of his own nephews. Uh, Cardinal Deniels, who replaced him, who was part of the St. Gala Mafia, he knew that. And he's caught on tape basically telling one of the nephews to let it all go. The Vatican knew it, and that man was not laicized. Daniel uh, Daniels was not, was not uh, punished for, for covering it up, even though he knew. And now the reputation of this scandal in Belgium and the Belgian church has gotten to the point where not only will it mar, will it mar the, uh, the papal visit that's coming up in 2024, but far more importantly, some 9,000 Catholics have abandoned Holy Mother Church because of the scandal there. 9,000 Catholics have walked outside, have abandoned the church. The once saved, always saved crowd is happy to welcome them in. The secular crowd, the atheist crowd is happy to welcome and celebrate their abandonment of the sacrament of salvation on earth. There is no salvation outside of the church. 
And do you see, if I were Satan, this is, would be my frontal attack. This would be where I would have put all my effort and forces. If I could crack the dam, if I could make the one true church look as though it is defeated, as though it is corrupted from within, rot from within, how many souls would I steal away from the hand of God? 9,000 people. We ought to proclaim on the mountaintops, to the rafters, as loud and as often as we can, that we will not tolerate the wolves in sheep's clothing, that the cockroaches must never feel at home. Turn on the lights before it is too late. And then get on your knees, pray, fast, do penance, skip a meal, put a pebble in your shoe, pray extra rosaries for the wolves because their judgment is coming too. And God has asked you and me to not only to forgive, but to join him on the cross. We'll be right back. We hear all the time from listeners who discovered the station by seeing a Try God bumper magnet in traffic. You can request a free bumper magnet and start evangelizing just by driving around town. Go to thestationofthecross.com and click on promotional material under the About tab. There you can request a magnet for your listening area. We even have one for the iCatholic Radio mobile app. Request yours today. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here are your headline news. Ground News reports Senator Joe Manchin says his wife is in stable condition following a car crash. Senator Joe Manchin's wife, Gail, was involved in a car crash in Alabama and is in stable condition at UAB Hospital. Gail Manchin is the federal co-chair of the Appalachian Regional Commission and was heading to an event there in Birmingham at the time of the crash. You might recall Senator Manchin just recently reported that he might run as a third-party candidate for the president. We'll see. Breitbart reports Elon Musk announces Neuralink has implanted a brain chip into a human. Neuralink, a neurotechnology company founded by Elon Musk back in 2016, has developed a brain-machine interface consisting of thousands of electrodes attached to flexible threads that can be implanted in the brain. The goal is to create a wireless device capable of recording and stimulating brain activity as a way of potentially treating neurological conditions. According to Musk, the first human implant of Neuralink's brain chip has been completed and is showing positive results so far. Musk stated that the first Neuralink product will be called telepathy and will allow users to control devices like phones or computers simply by thinking. Musk envisions it could eventually help paralyzed patients communicate faster than typing or even allow for symbiosis with artificial intelligence. I wonder who's... You going to volunteer? I'm just curious. A Catholic vote is reporting judge finds six pro-lifers guilty. Six pro-lifers are facing up to 11 years in prison after a judge found them guilty of violating the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Act. But the religious freedom law firm representing the group's leader has announced that they will appeal the conviction. And those those are your headline news. Let's pray for those pro-lifers. Let's pray for the pro-lifers that are dealing with, uh, boy, if I can learn how to operate my cameras, I'd be better off. But let's pray for the pro-lifers that are looking at prison right now. Hey, by the way, good morning to everybody on iCatholic Radio. If you're listening on the iCatholic Radio app right now, praise be to God. We are grateful that you are on the team. We've seen uh, we've seen a lot of people hanging out and growing on the iCatholic Radio app, and there's all kinds of great stuff there. You can get the live radio feed, 24-7 Catholic Radio We have live video of the programs we produce, like this one, for instance, Ask a Priest Live, The Simple Truth, Mother Miriam, uh, Father Mateg's program is also on there. We also have podcasts available and more, plus ICR Plus content, premium content is there in the iCatholic Radio app. Download it in your iOS and Android app store today. Leave us a review. That'd be pretty amazing if you could do that. But uh, joining us once again on the program, it's been now a few months is uh, the author of Revelations, the Hidden Secret Messages and Prophecies of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Xavier reyes Eral. Good morning to you. Welcome back to the show. And good morning to you, Joe. How are you? Praise be to God. I, I am alive, and that counts. How are you? <laughs> yes, and hello to your technical team as well. 
All terrific, uh, let's, terrific chaps. Let's t- let's talk French Revolution. You have a wonderful French accent. I'm sure you get told that every day now that you live in America. It's you use it to your advantage. <laughs> you're you're no dummy. I love it. But uh, let's talk about the French Revolution. The, I I picked up a book published by Tan uh, back in the 1970s that goes over in times prophecies. And there is a lot of prophecies. You cover a lot of them in your book as well that are specifically mm-hmm. related to the French Revolution. I think as an American, I can only vaguely understand the significance of the French Revolution. I would like to hear your take on that, but specifically how these prophecies seem to indicate that the French Revolution is still in full swing and it's affecting the entire world, not just France. What say you, Xavier? Yes, that's a very lucid analysis of, uh, of uh, events, particularly of French history. The French Revolution, and I'm not going to go in, into an ever so boring long story, but to make it short, it started in the, at the very end of the 18th century, in the 1700s, uh, 1789. And it was initially inspired by Freemasonry. Uh, Freemasonry that had lodged itself within the French aristocracy of the time, and with the French population, which was going through, well, mostly in Paris, not in the French countryside, through financial and economical upheaval. No? The French population in Paris was going through um, some, yes, indeed, some um, problems with uh, f- uh, the food distribution. There were issues in the French capital because of lack of organization and mismanagement. However, in the French countryside, the rest of the French countryside, in its immense majority, was living with a certain joie de vivre and with a profound mm. devotion to God, to the king, and to France. Now, these particular um, aristocrats uh, of France who were rebellious to the king were mostly inspired through their um, uh, counterpart in Scotland and in England, who initially started since 1717 the first free Masonic lodges in the, anywhere in the European continent. And that is how the French Revolution started, with one principal objective, to eliminate uh, monarchy, which had its roots deeply planted within the Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church. Louis, King Louis XVI and Queen Marie Antoinette, who was in fact Austrian, she was uh, the daughter of the emperor of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, their marriage was uh, to seal an alliance be- between the French kingdom and the empire of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, both of them were exemplary Catholic practicing, pra- practicing Catholics. No? And they had some marvelous children. The eldest died uh, in the beginning, at the very beginning of the, when the French... Uh, revolution began. The second one, uh, whose name uh, was uh, likewise um, Louis, uh, was, became automatically the Dauphin. The Dauphin is a title uh, which translates into English for the, the Prince of France. Again, to make a long story short, while the revolution took place, the new parliamentary government uh, passed a vote, whereas whether or not to execute King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, they could not, they could hardly execute through the guillotine uh, young children. And the immense majority, or rather, not the immense majority, but uh, I would say a good half of the new parliamentary government was in favor in view of the fact that Louis XVI agreed to make a new kingdom on the same basis as today England is, with a monarch that would be there simply to unite France, but the government would, be, would become uh, democratic and popular. So finally, there were some uh, aristocrats that became part of the French parliament, Freemasons, who were distraught with the idea that their plans were was about to fall on the floor. And they didn't have enough uh, to condemn uh, the king of France and his wife, the queen. However, the French king had a cousin whose name was uh, Philippe, Philippe of the House of Bourbon, the royal family, but of the House of Orléans. This man was a Freemason. And Mm. his vote, and his vote alone, 
was that which shifted uh, by 50.1% uh, the vote in favor of executing his cousin, the king, and the queen of France, Marie Antoinette. The line of both, or rather Philippe, and he called himself Philippe Egalité, Philippe uh, Equality, no? and his mm. descendants are all the way up to here today, um, pretendant to the French crown. Now, the Blessed Virgin Mary, mystics and visionaries, has said that the family d'Orléans, the family, the descendants of Philippe Egalité, the man whose vote decided on the guillotine against King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette, was a, is a bad family. And it is not God's will for this branch of the royal family to ever sit on the throne ever again. Wow. As a matter of fact, a member today of the Bourbon of the House of Orléans, today in France, opened uh, a few years ago a new Masonic lodge called, ironically enough, the Fleur de Lys. Ooh. Now, and yes, where it gets interesting, Joe, I will reveal to you what we discussed before, I think, one of your shows, that a great secret, and one which is part of the secret of la, the approved apparition site of La Salette, mm. approved by the local bishop, uh, by the dicasterium of the doctrine of the faith of the time. And this is the secret. Louis the Seventeenth, young Louis the Seventeenth, who was but a mere 10 years old little boy, who was placed in a cell, disgracefully, in a jail called Le Temple. Supposedly, uh, his body was found uh, filled with um, disease and dead. But it was an autopsy. And the autopsy of that cadaver showed the cadaver of a young teenage boy, 14 years old. And it is said that this, it did not match the description of the little French prince. What's more, the doctor who was assigned to his jail, uh, surprisingly enough, who took a great affection for the little boy, he took pity on the boy, suddenly when he was called to uh, give testimony whether indeed the cadaver was the prince of France, mysteriously disappeared, never to be found again. So, the secret of La Salette is this. Louis the Seventeenth, Prince of France, survived, was rescued by some faithful royalist, took him out of the temple, replaced him with the corpse of a 14-year-old boy who was deaf and mute, and was taken out of France. Furthermore, the secret is this. The day will come when the descendant of Louis the Seventeenth um, will be called to, call, to come back to France uh, at its worst period of history, to rescue not just France, to deliver it from an invader, and to restitute on the throne of Peter a new, quote-unquote, angelic pope. This French monarch, according to uh, the visionaries of La Salette and of Marie-Julie Jeanne in uh, La Fraude in Brittany, chapter, most likely the largest chapter I wrote in my book, declare mm. that this young man will be born in France, but again will be taken out of the country because of the innumerous enemies he will have. According to the prophecies, this French monarch, his uh, existence is, has been made aware to his enemies, the Republicans, the Freemasons, who are actively looking for him, and to the, the pretenders of today's French crown who, as mm -hmm. I mentioned, come from a branch of a family that is less than reputable. This man I, think most, I think most people think that Napoleon basically put an end to the, to the bloodshed or the, the carnage and the chaos of the French Revolution. But I argue that the French Revolution is alive and well and has spread throughout the world, and we're seeing that spirit of revolution, which has its forefathers in the Protestant Revolution, has its forefathers in the Revolution of the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3. So we, the fallen human man is inclined to revolution. But this effort from the Free Mason Lodge that you bring up, uh, you know, I think is important for us to, to, to pay attention to today because I think it's one of those like shell games of the devil, right? Like, don't look over here. Nothing is happening anymore. It's all over. Everything is fine. We're all just moving on to democracies. 
And we saw that spread through the West. And now we're what the kind of chaos that we're seeing at all of these same governments, unless they turn back to God, they won't find peace, will they? Absolutely. And this particular matter does not just limit itself to geopolitical matters or events. It involves including the Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church. To name but one, probably the most uh, well-known example would be His Eminence Cardinal Martini, who used to be the Cardinal Archbishop of the city of Milan. He was a well-renowned Freemason. And his ideas today are followed by today's um, most uh, highest authority within the Catholic Church hierarchy in Rome. You, only, you don't have to look very far to see some of the, of the evidence. Uh, you, you only have to look at uh, the latest uh, statement in Fiducia Supplicans, <laughs> which remarkably enough uh, came about publicly uh, sometimes last month, on the 17th of December, exactly. the eve yeah. of, the, of the birthday of uh, Pope John Paul, John Paul. Of uh, Pope Francis, what a tremendous lapsus. Hold that but thought. Indeed. Xavier Reyes, Aral is our guest. We're uh, talking about French Revolution and prophecies, the end times. We're going to get into more of the end times part. What's coming next? Does he have any updates for us? We're going to get his take on all of that. We'll put the show note link there for you to his book, Revelations. All that plus more is coming up right after this quick break. Do us a favor, though. Share us with a friend. Catholic Take, we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Tick, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Coming up at the top of the hour, we say goodbye to the radio. We stay on the live video feed for the after show where we get your comments and your questions, and you can ask whatever you want. We'll talk about whatever's on your mind. If you want, you can hang out with us on one of the live video feeds. If you go to the stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT, you'll see the live video player there along with show notes and signing up to the email list and all the icons underneath that's where you can find places like youtube and facebook and rumble so that where you can comment live and hang out with us that's coming up at the top of the hour Xavier reyes Aral is our guest his book is revelations the hidden secret messages and prophecies of the blessed virgin mary we will link to it in the show notes for you today so you can check it out but Xavier, welcome back to the show we're talking about the french revolution and i'm i'm very fascinated by this topic I love history. I like reading about history. And uh, I think that the uh, what's interesting and fascinating to me is the idea that there is this shell game goes on by the diabolical forces in the world. And those that would participate, like you said, the Freemasons, for example, you know, um, we're seeing this shell game today. We, we, you know, was was uh, Marie Antoinette, was she a good Catholic or was she exactly as we've been told all these years you know, let them eat cake is the famous phrase that we've been given. It's a bit of a shell game. You know, everything is settled now. Napoleon, he solved all this. Or are we still dealing with this? <laughs> what? Look at France today. Does France seem settled? It seems chaotic to me. It seems like they, like Ireland, like England, they, like uh, Spain now and Italy, they're all rejecting their Catholic heritage, their patrimony. But France in particular, as you pointed out in the last segment with French, with his prophecies, has a role to play in the end times. So let's talk about the end times in particular here. Can you give us, and you've done this in the past for us, can you give us a summary of the series of events that we that we will be seeing that will lead up to, to the final consummation and the second coming? Absolutely. Uh, very quickly, just before, with your permission, uh, this sentence of let them eat cake, uh, and by the way, be very careful and not to believe always, in those Hollywood movies, I've seen the latest <laughs> movies uh, depicting Louis the King, the 16th and Marie Antoinette. There is a lot of things that were true, but a lot of exaggeration and uh, a lot of show from Hollywood that does not echo properly the history of, of uh, that era. That being said, Marie Antoinette's uh, phrase, let them eat cake, was when there were a group, small group of about 200 uh, Parisians who came all the way to Versailles, who were hungry, and came to the gates and they were demanding for uh, a new administration to uh, deliver food. And the king of France and the queen came came in to the gates and said, uh, Mesdames, Messieurs, welcome to my home. How can I help you? And he listened to them and to their grievances. And they said, Your Majesty, we are hungry. We cannot feed our children. And the queen immediately ordered the valet to bring all the cakes that were in the kitchen to give to the children and to the populace. Mm-hmm. And the king and the queen helped and, su- and helped 
serve the French people who came to their gates, and the French people went back to Paris. Wow. The French king and the queen were not made aware of the reality of the crisis that took place in Paris at the time. It was not a question of evil or anything of the sort, and as for Napoleon Bonaparte, when the guillotine took place, he was not, as the movie Napoleon lately uh, depicted, uh, witnessing the guillotine of Marie Antoinette, he was uh, fighting the Battle of Toulon at the time. So be on your guard against Hollywood uh, exaggeration or falsehood. As for uh, the future and what has been predicted, what is coming, as of right now in France, is going through a tremendous turmoil. The French agriculturists, those who um, de develop the lands, uh, the farms, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, are mounting an assault on Paris, as we speak. All the main, avenue, all the main roads from every city of France that lead to, to Paris and outside Paris are being blocked by an army of tractors, an army of agriculturists and their families who are come here, are coming to Paris to protest. And this is leading all sorts of other groups in France uh, rising against uh, the politics of the newly elected prime minister who works with Emmanuel Macron, who is now today considered by some polls as the worst French president of the Fifth Republic, since wow. which was uh, created by General de Gaulle. The situation is dire. And um, the army will not be used. The police cannot do anything without causing um, um, casualties. Already there's been some uh, agriculturists that have been killed because of the situation, and all of France was in mourning. The situation is very, very bad. The economy uh, is uh, on its knees. And uh, remember, we're talking about a country like France, who used to be before the econ economic union of, the, of Europe became the European Union. Yeah, France was the first agricultural power in the, in the continent. First produce of wheat, first produce of milk, first produce of chicken and eggs. Now we are forced to burn thousands of tons of all our products in order to comply and let other Europeans uh, import their products in France. It's absolutely outrageous. The communists are taking advantage of this situation in France. And they have formed a new political um, group called the NUPES, which has allied itself with the pro-Muslim parties in the country. Now, I am immensely great, uh, regretful to say what I'm about to tell you as a Frenchman who watches the French news every day from his home in the States. But right now, there are more practicing Muslims in France than there are practicing Catholic. We're talking about the Catholic Church, Wow. eldest daughter. And this has been foretold, among others, by Marie-Julie Jeannie. The future. Now, the future predicts the following. According to the prophecies of Marie-Julie Jeannie in La Fraude and of La Salette, there will be further uprising in France. There will be a sort of a new revolution. In the words of our Lord, I'm open quotes, I must call Frenchmen against Frenchmen, although they are not. In this event, our Lord meant all the paper Frenchmen, that is to say the immigrants who have national papers but who have absolutely no lost love for France, for history, mm. or its culture. There will be, a, according to prophecy, in which today is already taking place, an alliance between the Socialist Party, the Communist Party, and all the movements pro-Islam. And according to prophecy, they will rise, they will to the point of putting fire in all the main avenues and streets of Paris, forcing the French government to leave the Élysée. The Élysée Palace is the equivalent of your uh, White House in Washington. That's our White House in Paris. The government, according to prophecy, will flee. According to further prophecies from marie Lijani and La Salette and others, the Russians will take advantage of this chaos and this fiasco that will not only take place in France, but in Italy, Germany, Spain and England, the major powers in the continent and will, from that moment forth, initiate a military conflict that will take them through a blitzkrieg immediately up to the Rhine River. Wow. You know, it's interesting you point that out because just this morning I saw a news article where Vladimir Putin was weighing in on some of the stories of the day, and he particularly focused on what's going on here in Texas with the border crisis and the National Guard standoff with federal authorities. By the way, Biden uh, is uh, punishing Texas by limiting exports of certain gas and, uh, and oil products. But nonetheless, Putin saw this and says, 
a major civil war in America could be on the horizon. So almost to your point there, Russia is paying attention very keenly as to the dynamics in all of these countries. What do they mean to do with that? I can't say. But the prophecy still seems to think that Russia is coming across that border and invading Europe. So, all right, so where does that take us then? How long do, do, do these periods of war and conflict last before we see the rise of this French monarch? And is the French monarch born and raised in France? Is he French blood? Who is this person? You have about two minutes. I'll go quickly. His name is Henry the fifth of the cross, that he will be known by that name. That man, that the Prince of France, the legitimate descendant of Louis the Sixteenth of Marie Antoinette, was born in France. Today he's not living in France, but he's aware and he's watching. And he's waiting for a privileged soul who will be chosen in France to come to him and guide him to uh, go to France to rescue France from an incoming invader and to restitute and put back in Rome a true pope, an angelic pope. Wow. I lied to you. You didn't have two minutes. You had only 45 seconds and you did a great job. <laughs> Xavier Reyes Eral uh, is uh, our guest. Revelations, the hidden secret messages and prophecies of the Blessed Virgin Mary is his book. We're going to put a link to it in the show notes for you at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. Xavier, if you can hang out for the after show, we'd love to continue our conversation and your conversation, dear listener. You can hang out with us. Go to the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. And we are back. Welcome to the after show, everyone. Good morning, everybody. Boy, I didn't, didn't manage that well, did I? <laughs> you got two minutes, and then music starts. Oh, whoops. Sorry. You did great, though, Ozabi. You did, you did. You're a pro. Thank you for it. Hey, Jen, good morning to you. Mimi and Sharon, Janice, good morning to you. Mike K., good morning to you. Praise be to God. T-Storm's in, in here in the house. Uh, good morning to you. Praise be to God. Anna, good morning to you. Y- Yvonne. Good morning to you, Paul, our friend from Buffalo. Sharon is here as well. Eileen, Nick, the mic is here. Good morning to you. Praise be to God. Troy Lockett commenting this morning. I saw Sci-Fi Mike is chiming in. Sci-Fi the mic is here. So I I love this blast to the past of the CDT days. I think that's just amazing. So good morning to you, Sci-Fi Honey West 25. Uh, Good morning to you, Patty. Good morning to you, Don Franco. Good morning to you, Donald Paddock and Mimi and... And Jane, good morning to you. Praise be to God. Junior Barra, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today over on Facebook as well. Lots of people hanging out over on Rubble. If you are new here and you've never commented, do us a great favor and uh, leave a comment. Let us know where you're from. Liz Fench, guten Morgen. Yeah, good morning. Or we got to say it the Catholic way. It's Gus, Gus, Gus Christ. How, Gruscott. Do, how do we say it, Jake? Gruscott. Scott. Thank you. I'll, I, it's going to take me a long time to <laughs> figure that out. Gruce Cot, is that got, right? Got, G-O-T, got, yeah. Got, Gruce got, Gruce Gruce got. Gruce got. We're gonna remember. We're gonna figure it out. I'll hey, good morning, out. TJ <laughs> Brand. Colin, good morning to you. Female KC Royals fan from Nebraska is in the house. Jay Coke, good morning to you. M, the letter M is here. That's amazing. Kilroy Jones, Troy Lockett, Sharon, Pete Santos, Master Baker seventy eight is here. Praise be to God. Kilroy Jones, K W D Carre. I hope I said that right. There's an emphasis on the E there. I'm not sure. Uh, Michael, uh, good morning to you. Uh, let's see here. Some, I see some new names. Praise be to God. Someone said bonjour. Oh, TJ Brand said bonjour. <laughs> uh, Merci, said uh, KW. I took French in the sixth grade. Uh, it, it was terrible. It was a terrible experience for the teacher mostly because she had to put up with me the whole time. Surprise puppies, good morning to you. Glad you're on the team today. Chris Anderson, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Appreciate seeing you here. Let us know if you guys have any questions for Xavier in particular. Catherine Hickey, good morning to you. Catholic824 is on the team today. Good morning to you. Appreciate it. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Um, so, uh, hold on. Lil, Lil, da- Lil Daisy is here. Lil Daisy, I like that. Robert Stevenson, uh, Evelyn, good morning to you. Thanks for being on the team. Um, Anna. Uh, T. Brand is asking a question. Let me come back to that. Uh, But uh, Anna in the private telegram group was asking me to make sure that I asked you, you have an update of sorts or you're going to be releasing an update of sorts on Prophecy in February. What's that about? Yes, uh, that's a good, very good point. Um, In the book, I write as well about more contemporary operation sites, such as uh, that of Garabandal, Medjugorje, 
and of a particular a French Canadian priest uh, who uh, his name is uh, Father Michel Rodrigue in Quebec. Uh, Father Michel Rodrigue um, uh, has made some prophecies. Uh, the latest one of all was that, and that came from uh, last summer, that uh, tribulations would start in October of last year. And it happened exactly as he predicted, you know, with uh, wow. the attack, the war in uh, the Middle East. Uh, he received on um, December the 31st a message uh, from God the Father, uh, which uh, I have received in French and English, and which is to be released, um, and I've been already invited through a collection of podcasts to release it in mid end of February. So uh, I, um, if you if you are interested, I will read it. If you yeah. ever so kind to invite me again in February, come on back. Release it to your public. That, that ought to be interesting. Yeah, come on back. Yes. Uh, TJ Brand asks the question: Will all this happen? What will? I guess. Let me rephrase the question. He's asking: Will all this happen this year? But I, I, let me ask a more specific question, similarly related. TJ Brand, Xavier, what do you anticipate happening in twenty twenty four? Well, um, the, the situation is truly grave. It's not just a subject of conversation on a radio show. The main purpose of this book and of this talk is simply to warn people of what is coming in 2024 will be pivotal, uh, according to what we know. Uh, the war, uh, particularly in Ukraine and in the Middle East, will spread. Right now there are talks, serious talks, about the war spreading up, up to Iran, which is uh, being considered as a target for the Allies. Uh, you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. that uh, Russia was watching. It is, and not just what, uh, Russia. There are other nations of major powers, such as China and North Korea, that are waiting for the proper time to act. So I do believe that 2024 will be pivotal in the sense that the war will spread and it will be a catalyst uh, to something that will be unstoppable. As, as of right now, the war just in the Middle East is convenient to all parties, to Israel, because it gives them a pretext finally to take over Gaza, to finish with Hamas, or at least to try to, and with Hezbollah in Lebanon, with the Muslims as well. It is to their advantage, because just before the attack in October of last year took place, there were already uh, poor parlays between Saudi Arabia and Israel for a sort of rapprochement, diplomatic um, gathering and friendliness. These did not match into uh, the fundamentalist Islamic uh, organization in the Middle East in, or in their plans. So this war now pushed completely Saudi Arabia on the side of the Muslim nations. So it, it is clearly in the purpose of Islam for this war to continue to form a unity between all Shiites, Sunnites and Websalites. No? It is also in the to the advantage of the of the West, simply because now their presence is there and it gives them a chance to strike at an, a nation of Iran, which has been enriching its uranium uh, arsenal for the past few years. They are very close from having enough enriched uranium to develop a nuclear arsenal. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is something totally and completely unacceptable for the United States and for the European allies. So it is a war that is to everyone's advantage. Russia observes quietly. It's finishing Ukraine. Ukraine cannot stand much longer. When Ukraine falls, Ukraine falls, according to prophecies, all the events in Europe will start and will add up to this major fiasco. And then this, ma this matter that I mentioned would be unstoppable, would start to uh, begin. And then we're going to enter into a new chapter of history that will be talked about and discussed as a point of reference for centuries to come. Mm. Uh, Carl asks the question, according to the book, Catholic Prophecy, published by Tan, the French king will also be of German descent. Can you elaborate on this? Do you, I mean, I mean, the royal families have been, they're all over Europe. They're basically uh, of similar blood all over Europe, are they not? Quite so. Um, to give you an example, even the king of Spain today is a Bourbon. Uh, it comes from the line of uh, Louis XIV. Wow. So, yes, all the families, wow. the royal families in England are half German, half English. They have some French as well, Scottish, and so on and so forth. It's all a mixture. But altogether, the French king, Henry V of the Cross, 
as Marie Jolie Jenny called him, as the children of La Salette called him and others. Uh, and by the way, a king which has been mentioned as, as well in the writings of Saint Padre Pio. No, it's important to know that as well. But this man uh, will be a descendant of Marie Antoinette. Marie Antoinette was Austrian, as I mentioned earlier. It's a Germanic nation. Uh, mm. So yes, indeed, they will have some Germanic uh, roots. But the man, um, uh, Henry V, will be a Frenchman born in France, but raised abroad. And he will live a very humble life. He will try not to attract attention. No one will even suspect that he is who he is. Uh, so right now, as I mentioned, he's, I don't even know if he's listening to this show. It's quite <laughs> possible. He's watching. He's praying. And he knows exactly what his destiny is. He's waiting for uh, this messenger to come and for his time to come. He's due to make himself known when uh, the situation in France will be dire. It will be partly invaded, not totally. And his task will be to come back to France take the reins of whatever is left of the remnants of the French army and NATO and push back through a miracle war and campaign the Russian Eastern Europeans and Muslim invaders who will come from the south. He will push them back all the way beyond mm -hmm. the Rhine River, along with the Spanish king, according to prophecy, and he will start a campaign that will last about three years in Italy to liberate Italy, reach Rome, and re replace or place on an empty throne of Peter and quote-unquote an angelic pope who will restore the glory of the Catholic Church, its rules, and the faith of yesteryears. This is the yeah. compressed Angel Knight. Uh, resume. Uh, yes. <laughs> Angel Knight, I was just going to say, welcome, Angel Knight. Welcome back to the team. Glad you're here. Praise be to God. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt. I, I, one thing all. that came to mind as you, as you just were talking about the sort of the humbleness and uh, – in the humility of of Henry, wherever he is, and you know, of course he's listening. He's, he's probably a big subscriber of the show. Of course, the French monarch would be listening. <laughs> now that would that's kind of a hilarious thought, to be honest with you. But uh, uh, I was reminded of the gospel today. Jesus in his own hometown, and it just amazed the lack of faith from his own kinsfolk, and how they and because they lacked faith, because they were incredulous, because they. Uh, because they doubted and they were like, who is this guy? We know this is the son of the carpenter is not Mary here as brothers and sisters. Like they're just, they're digging on him. And, uh, and the reason why that came to my mind is because Nazareth, which literally translates as branch town, meaning branch from the stump of Jesse, meaning David. So when the Israelite king and his mother, the queen, the Gibirah, were taken off into exile into Babylon in the Babylonian exile, uh, we, we sort of lose, lose track of the trail at that point of the, of the monarchy of Israel. Well, when they come back out of, uh, out of uh, enslavement, out of exile in Babylon, some of them go to and create the town that is called Nazareth, and others go back to to Bethlehem, which is their root, right? Which is where they're from, which is where David was from. So the town Nazareth is where the royal descendants of David, some at least some of them were. So the very fact that uh, Joseph and Mary come from that lineage is is royal, but it's also very humble. Like they, they were like <laughs> quiet lives, doing our thing. We don't need to rock the boat. We don't need to get involved. We're just quietly living a peaceful life and yet they were of royal blood so i just saw a parallel there when you were saying that talking about henry in that regard and it is a fascinating thought to to contemplate the fact that there is there could be a person out there who's quietly living might be your neighbor you've talked to them a billion times you, you know you hung out with them while they were taking their trash bin back after the garbage guy picked it up and um and they might end up being the french monarch that pushes back and wins the war, establishes uh, a holy holy Roman pope to sort of overcome all of the scandals that we're currently facing. And what was fascinating to me about the book that I got from Tan that was published in the 70s, I found it on eBay, used, um, is the sheer volume of private revelation in many mm -hmm. different countries, in many different centuries, all with the same theme. There will be a French monarch who will come at a great time of turmoil and will push back. There'll be a Holy Roman Pope, and the two of them will work together to, to reestablish Christendom. 
And uh, that sheer volume, I think, is hard to overcome. When you, when you know, in order to be a skeptic, you would have to overcome the idea that how how do you get these people who are disconnected from each other over many centuries, essentially talking in and giving the same prophecy, right? Yes, you mentioned you asked a question that was very assiduous. I thought it was very interesting a few moments ago. Timeline: um, We know for a fact that this king right now uh, is watching and preparing. We know that the time when he will make his presence be known is imminent. And that I know as well from some contemporary visionaries I work with. This means that since he will make himself be known in a dire situation in the European continent, a war, and part, partly France being partly invaded, it means that the course of events will precipitate themselves. Now, we know that um, this man is Catholic. He is a fervent Catholic man. He prays. He goes to Mass. He watches everything he can get his hands on. Um, there was a particular uh, clue of the utmost importance. And I don't remember if I mentioned it on your show. I've been to quite a few other than I'm yours. Sure you but this is a, a clue that has been given through visionary stigmatist Marie Jeligeny in Brittany, mm. which, um, as I said, I wrote a, the largest chapter of my book on her because her revelations are exceptional. It took me three years of investigation dealing with Father René Laurentin, with whom I worked for eight years, and I gathered all the notes that I got from him when I worked with him, with the, do- with the granddaughter of the Marquis de la Francrie in France, who was her bi- old biographer. No? I'm friends mm. with her, and I amassed a million amount of information and documents. That being said, wow. the clue was this, on two particular messages, that the French visionary stigma is received. And the message was this, that the beginning of the unfolding of all these prophecies that we've just been talking on your show will take place between the year 80 and 83. Now, I know it's, um, it's very peculiar. What did that mean? It, it was not 1880 to 1883, no, 1980, 1983, just 1883. Blimey, uh, Joseph, it took me forever to finally come up with a theory which dawned on me as I was finishing the book in uh, 2017, 2018 or so. And I came up with an idea. It had to be a point of reference based on an important event in Marie-Julie Jenny's life. And then uh, as I was finishing the book, I wrote one thing that uh, uh, the granddaughter of the Marquis de la Francrie sent me, which was a prophecy that stated that God told her that her body after she would pass away, she died in 1941 during the German occupation of France, right, Joseph? Well, uh, her body and that of her sister, who was a remarkable helper, she loved her sister and an exemplary Catholic, practicing Catholic, both their bodies would be exhumed and found in corrupt. Furthermore, listen to this, the body of marie julie Janice would be found not only in corrupt, but her heart still beating. Wow. Now, I thought to myself, the only time this happened before was with Joan of Arc, when she was uh, uh, burned on by, with oil by the English. After she was uh, consumed, only her heart remained still beating with her entrails. They did again, same thing. And they threw, finally, the heart to the Seine River. But I thought to myself, Joseph, could it be that the point of reference would be the death year of Marie-Julie Jeanne? So I began to wonder, and I added 80 years to 1941. And I reached the year 2021. I added mm. 83 years to 1941, and I reached the year 2024. So mm. I thought to myself, could that be it? It's extraordinary. And then I thought, what happened in 2021? Well, as we all know, it was the zenith of the pandemic. Pandemia, which, for the first time in church history, forced every single Roman Catholic church, or almost, around the planet, to close their doors. Incredible. What happened in 2022? The unthinkable. Russia attacked Ukraine, flirting with World War III. What happened with 2023? The war between um, Russia and Ukraine stopped being between Russia and Ukraine. It became a world war of sorts between NATO and an alliance between Russia, Iran, North Korea, and yes, China. And what's more, the year ended with the spreading of the war through the Middle East. Now, we've just entered 2024. So that is um, 
a year, which I, for me at least, it forces me to hold my breath with anticipation. Yeah. I am not looking forward yeah. for this year. No. Um, well, I think we're made for times like this. And if we resign ourselves to God's holy will and accept whatever it comes as though it comes from his permissive will at the very least, and then we can accept our role in that and, and be obedient. And so we don't, I don't think we have to fear of what comes next, but I do think we have to buckle up uh, because it's going to be a bumpy ride. And something I talked about uh, in the first segment of my show uh, was what our, my role is. Have I, as a Catholic media person, caused great division? Have I been a tool of the diabolic to, to further fan the flame of division in the Holy Church because I have talked so candidly about all of these scandals? And, of course, my argument is no. Um, we, have, we have a duty and obligation to, to shine the light of Christ so that the cockroaches will run. Uh, but we have to be obedient, we have to be faithful, we have to be uh, zealous. And and part of that process is, of course, offering penance. And so I want to challenge my audience to say, get on your knees this Lent, put a pebble in your shoe, skip a meal, uh, sleep less, specifically for the conversion of the wolves in sheep's clothing, because the millstones are being made for them and hell is forever, and people go there, in spite of what some people in the Vatican might say to the contrary. So, uh, I mean, I think that's just re re real, and we have to deal with that. Troy Lockett asks the question, does Xavier think that the burning plague in his book is a new form of COVID that was researched and published recently in China? That's a very good question. It's too early to tell. The burning plague was foretold by Marie-Julie Genie as well, and uh, according to the revelation she received, it will be a plague that will be that will claim the lives of millions, and a plague through which um, men's medical art will find no answer. There will be, and it will be airborne. It will be terribly contagious. But there is hope, for indeed, uh, in through the revelation of Marie Julegeni, she states uh, that uh, this particular disease will be able to be counteracted with only one leaf. And again, I never sure I hate having to pronounce it because my French accent makes me handicapped with the pronunciation of this <laughs> blooming thing. But it's called the hawthorn, hawthorn uh, leaf, H-A-W-T-H-O-R-N. And the Virgin Mary even gave a um, recipe how to apply it. We are, she mentioned, uh, to use it, to drink it, to consume it three times a day uh, when the early symptoms show, which will be, a headache, high blood pressure, problems with speech, and tremendous burning of the skin, which they will, be, will begin with redness, immediately followed with blackness and a yellow center. It will be terribly, terribly painful. But the Virgin Mary asks, as an act of faith, to, uh, at the early stages of the symptoms, to make a um, fusion, a tea of sorts, with this particular Hawthorne leaf. Quantity matters not. But you are, we are supposed to boil a pot of water, for and once it's boiling, to put the leaves in there, cover it with a cover for 14 minutes, not 13 minutes, not 15 minutes, but for 14 minutes. Then turn off, of course, while you do, of course, you have to turn off the, the fire, you know, as it um, goes through the 14 minutes. Then make it go through a filter of sort and consume it three times a day with faith and with praying, the prayers which I uh, underline in the book. I had myself, I have to tell you, Joe, difficulty accepting that. I thought, this is too American, too American Hollywood. <laughs> Why would the Virgin Mary ask something of the sort? And I did not understand. Until, uh, <laughs> as we say here in America. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought it was, something was wrong. But it came from my country, from France. And then my father, years ago, offered me a book on uh, the, the miracles of Lourdes. And then I read on the Old Testament uh, when God asked uh, Moses to have uh, the threshold of every Jewish home placed with the blood of the lamb to protect them from the angel destructor that was about to hit yeah. every Egyptian first son. Yeah. So I thought to myself, is this really ridiculous after all? And when I read the enormous amounts of miraculous healings that took place in Luz with people who either bathed or drank the water, it seemed so incredible, so sensationalist. Then I thought to myself, well, why not this? What is it that's so ridiculous about it? And then I remember something that Father Laurentin, Monsignor Laurentin, uh, used to tell me when I worked with him. He told me, Xavier, uh, we have always to approach everything with a spirit of criticism. And once you're convinced that this is coming from God, you cannot filter 
what is inconvenient and accept all, only that which is. We mm-hmm. must accept it all or deny it all. So yeah. uh, it seemed to me, again, it's an act of faith. And it, again, it's an act of profound love from an imploring voice, a motherly voice, what's more, that tells us how to prepare spiritually and physically. And the cornerstone of my books, and I've just finished my long-winded response to your question with this, the print, the cornerstone of the messages of the apparitions of the Virgin Mary, whether it's in Akita, approved by the church, or in San Nicola in Argentina, approved by the church, or in Betania, or in La Salette, or in La Frode, and so on and so forth, is this. Convert. Yeah. Yeah. Convert now before it's too late. And principally, by living your lives for the Holy Scriptures, the Gospels, by living the Holy Sacraments of the Catholic Church, particularly uh, Confession and the Holy Eucharist, while believing it is truly the body and blood, soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well said. Hey, Mike Peaches, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Praise the Lord. Lord, show us thy face and we shall be saved. Yea and amen. Uh, Salve Regina is here. Praise be to God. Good morning, and thanks for hanging out on Rumble today. If you're hanging out on Rumble, you've never commented, comment. Let us know you're here. Let us know where you're from. I saw somebody from Zambia earlier. That I said, was that Nick Vores? Nick, good morning, and welcome to the team. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Appreciate you being on the team. Catholic Cristero is here as well. Good morning to you. Uh, thanks for hanging out. Sounds like superstition. I guess it does have the air of that, but then I was just all thinking about... Uh, how in the Old Testament, especially after it, Exodus 32 and you get the golden calf, that, you know, they they had to they had to take that gold and that golden calf and put it into the water and they were forced to drink it. Of course, the bronze serpent had to be looked upon. Jesus spits and creates clay and mud, and rubs it on the eyes. I mean, most of the time he doesn't even need to do that. He can just will it and they're healed. Sometimes he touches them. Sometimes he uses material substances. Of course, he commanded the apostles use holy oils in the sacrament and the sacramentals and the, and the liturgies uh, that we, we get to enjoy, praise be to God. So, you know, we live in a material world and there are material qualities in, the, in, in our existence that we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So uh, once God, is, like you say, to your point, Xavier, once God has said so, well, then there you go. Who are we to, who are, who are we to judge? Someone famous once said that. Who are we to judge? Uh, wearing white at the time, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, I, I'm teasing. Yeah. I'm teasing. Alexandria Hall, good morning to you. BB, good morning to you. Anthony, good morning to you. Ginger71, good morning to you. Praise be to God. Alexandria Hall says, Xavier, uh, you keep me busy watching your videos while I do my housework every day and take care of my babies. Prayers for you and Joe. Well, thank you, Alexandria. You are amazing. Lost in Dimension, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. I saw uh, somebody on Facebook here. Let me get this is a question over here from Don. Don Franco said, did Sister Lucia suggest the whole of the third secret is contained in Revelation 12? What do you say to that, Xavier? She did. And she mentioned that in a particular letter she wrote to Father Fuentes a Mexican priest, and that is also in my book on the chapter of Fatima, on, uh, which states very clearly that we must, um, uh, in order to find out what the third secret is, it will be revealed in Apocalypse uh, chapter 12. That's absolutely correct. And um, regarding as well uh, the Catholic Church, what you mentioned is about causing division. I, I for one, listen to your show quite often. I, I think on the contrary, uh, and that is one thing that attracts me very much in your show and that you do with Jacob, no? Uh, and that is the fact that you you are guilty of only one thing, propagating the truth. <laughs> and let's not forget Amen. that Christ was crucified for the truth. Amen. Yeah, praise be to God. I like the way you say Jacob's name, Jacob. Jacob. How do you say, say it again? Like we do, we do. From now <laughs> on, French. this is how we're, Jacob. we're saying Jacob. <laughs> Jacob. 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 Boy, it sounds so good. Very, <laughs> very French. Way. Hey, uh, d- uh, f- uh, Piri, 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 Piri Gal, good morning to you. For, uh, Deo gracias. Glad you're on the team. Patricia Matthews, good morning to you. Mario's Favorites is here. Praise be to God. Get the purple scapular. Yay and amen. I'm on team purple scapular for sure. Uh, I saw that Salve Regina is from Saudi Arabia. I don't know that we've ever had anybody t- tune in from, Sal- uh, from Saudi Arabia before. Welcome. Glad you're here. Praise be to God. Uh, thanks for doing it. Uh, let's see here. I Joe, you missed see- it. Xavier's got the purple scapular. Do you? Yes. Oh, that's awesome. Yes, of course. Yours? I never separate. Ah, you Beautiful wearing yours? Family. I keep mine on the uh, downstairs for the for the house, but uh, maybe I should wear it too. That'd be pretty good. <laughs> um, 
Let's see here. Uh, Carl Thomas, good morning to you. Pete Santos is on the team. I know I saw uh, another question here. T-Storm, a good, accurate account in English of the French Revolution. Books, books, books. What do you recommend, Xavier, uh, for the French? Do you have any particularly favorite resources that you would recommend on the French Revolution? Oh, there are so many. Uh, Most of my sources come, obviously, from French books. Uh, I grew up there. I studied there in France. So um, I would say principally the history of France with uh, for the La Rousse edition. There are so many great writers that have written about the revolution. Um, I, I wouldn't know. Would I have a full library in mind that I could recommend? I'd I, recommend I Warren know where Carroll. To begin. Oh. I'd recommend Warren Carroll and yeah. his uh, his uh, magnum opus, uh, his uh, series on Christendom. You can find, uh, I can't remember exactly which volume it is. I can see the image on the cover uh, in my mind, but I don't remember which volume it is in this series. But if you found just the, and every volume is broken up by a period of time, so they have the dates on the front and the cover, you can look up uh, Warren Carroll. He is he is my favorite <laughs> Catholic historian, and uh, I think his writing is is spot on. Um, so I would recommend that. Check his uh, Check his writing out. It's very, very, very good. Uh, Nooney, good morning to you. Glad you're on the team today. Thank you for doing it. Praise be to God. Um, you know, this Friday is Candlemas. My wife, my wife has gone crazy with the beeswax. Like, uh, <laughs> she was, she spent all weekend long, you know, boiling and making beeswax, hundred percent beeswax candles. And she's, she's got a supply. I, I'm like, how many beeswax candles does one need? Three days of darkness says the prophecy say you only need one, one to last all three days. It's part of the miracle. But she has, she's made a tea light candle, 365. She has one for every day of the year. And then she made longer ones. And she's got, she's got more beeswax candles than I've got ammo for my gun collection. Let that sink in for a second. L- lest we forget, uh, speaking of things being very specific, beeswax candles for the Holy Mass, that used to be a, a strict requirement. There had to be mm-hmm. a, at least a certain amount of beeswax. And yeah. uh, the, you know, the, the Holy Eucharist, the bread has to be very specific. It's, you know, it has to be wheat. Can't be things added. You know, the, the specifics are, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're quite common. Yeah. So I was going to ask, Xavier, in the prophecies, is there a – does it have to be 100% beeswax? Is there any – like a, blessed candles, is a, I, I'm pretty sure is what's mentioned. Is there any mention of what – is it? does it need to be beeswax, I guess is my, my question. According to Padre Pio, Saint Padre Pio, and to stigmatist visionary Marie-Julie Jenny, who was informally approved by her local bishop, yes – it must be 100% beeswax. And it is good to know that, according to the prophecy by both uh, saints, uh, once the three days of darkness will begin, the, the candle could be this big. It will not be get consumed. It will last three days, even if it is that small or that small. And only one should be sufficient. Amen. Amen. Hey, Salve Regina says, My daughter recently read Les Miserables. She is enrolled in a classical school. What do you think of Les Miserables? What's your opinion of Les Miserables? Uh, Victor Hugo's Miserables. I had to make a thesis paper on it uh, when I was in France. I hate the story. I hate working <laughs> on that uh, particular thing. It gives me the blues. It's a very French uh, Victor Hugo uh, work. I'm not a particular fan. <laughs> but thank you yes. very much uh, for your uh, sympathy on that, man. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, so many Catholics will love, will say they love Les Miserables. I've seen it. I'm like, it's, it's, it's so French Revolution. It's I mean, pretty like, anti-clerical. We, yeah. What are we? What are we doing? Here? Why are we, why are we yes, doing this? it's, it's depressing. It's profoundly yeah. depressing, it and I, I don't, I don't find any attraction to it myself. Of course. Yeah, I'm in that camp for sure. Uh, Chris Anderson, good morning to you. Best place to buy Hawthorne tea. What would you recommend? <laughs> Ah, that's a marvelous question. Um, in my book, I refer to a lady called Mrs. Uh, Kathleen Lowney. I think she's in Ohio. She's a superb lady, magnificent person, and she sells everything, including the sacramentals of Marie-Julie Jeanne at cost. Now, she has had a lot of problems. She lost her husband recently. She had a hip replacement, so she was late 
with a lot of orders. But now she, she just sent me, without me ordering it, bags, two pound bags that's sealed with aluminum, filled with hawthorn leaves. So wow. I ordered another two. And uh, you can order, you have on my book, the email address when you can order it. All I ask is in advance uh, forgiveness on her behalf because she's overwhelmed. She's forced to get somebody to help her. And she's mm. getting orders from all across the world. And sometimes she's a little bit late, but please be indulgent and don't be suspicious of any scam or anything. So she's a charming lady, um, wingless angel. Uh, she will. Uh, she always fulfills the orders, but sometimes it takes a little bit of time because of the overwhelming amount of orders. And the, you can find. You said you can find her email contact in your book. In my book, yes. Okay. And she sells everything, as I said, at cost. And she where is no she profit. located? She does where it out of from? ideology. No, where where is she shipping She's from? She's in uh, Ohio. Ohio, okay. Got Ohio. It. Yeah, she's American. Oh. Does she ship lady. overseas? Charming. Does she ship? She ships the... overseas. She sends okay. Madagascar, New Zealand, Tasmania, Vietnam, South <laughs> Africa, Chile, wow. Brazil, French Polynesia. You name it. She she ships everywhere. Wow, wonderful. That's great. Praise be to God. Uh, Master yes. Baker seventy eight is asking Xavier, do you have any knowledge of the history of the Templar or the Templars, and if there is a connection to the Freemason Freemasons? I I could I have an answer to that, but Xavier, what would you say to that? Uh, yes, I am familiar with the history of the Templars. Uh, it's a, it's very complicated. It goes back to the times when he came back to when they came back from the Holy Land to France. The French king, Philippe V, had a tremendous uh, financial debt with the Templars. And um, in order to avoid having to pay such debt, he exterminated them. This immediately led a secret society within France and later without, within uh, other nations that uh, became not only to be anti-king, anti-royalist, but anti-Catholics and Christians. So they developed and they brought a great deal of treasures from the Holy Land. They, We know that uh, part of... W- wings from their organizations uh, have also worked and to this day are still working with the Illuminati that work with the free Masonic lodges. I know, again, it sounds very much like the Da Vinci Code uh, movie script, but there is a lot of truth in those particular scripts. Uh, yeah. they, they take their movies and the script based on uh, information they get from true sources. It is a matter to take to a certain point very seriously. Because, as I said, very much like in 1917, when the Blessed Virgin may appear to the children and announce prophecies which at the time made absolutely no sense. It wasn't realistic. Today we're living with something of the same sort. Remember, in 1970, when the Virgin in Fatima appeared, and she announced in the, when the war was not even, there was no light at the end of the tunnel yet. No. She announced, and it was a butchery. We all know I had a grandfather who fought in World War I he never had a proper night's sleep since 1918 until he passed away because of the, the inhumanity of the war. When the version announced to them that this war would, yes, would end, but a second one would occur sometimes thereafter, worse than the first one, if humanity did not return to her son, nobody wanted to hear those words. When she said that if humanity does not convert and returns to her son, Russia would spread her errors. Russia! Russia was a third world country that just had been pulverized by the armies of the Kaiser and of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They were pulverized and placed on their knees. It was a huge country with a massive uh, mass of land held and protected by an army of Cossacks who were so drunk after the time they could not stand straight on their horses. (laughs) It wasn't realistic. Today, some of the events, all the prophecies that have been told since La Salette in the mid-1800s, all the way to Father Michel Rodrigue. Today, it uh, seemed then unrealistic, and today we are seeing the reality of these then unrealistic prophecies become a reality. We are living it. Father Laurentin, and I finish, mm-hmm. used to tell me when we were working together in the 90s, 1990s, you know, Xavier, we are in the time of admonitions. I wonder if I live long enough to see the time of prophecies when they became, the prophecies will become a reality. Poor Father Laurentin became blind after I worked with him. Um, he died in 2017, and he only was beginning to see the very, very tip of the iceberg. I think there is no one today who is lucid, who knows geopolitics, 
who would be able to tell me, no, we're not living in this. We are witnessing all of these prophecies today being a reality, whether it's in uh, Eastern Europe, whether it's in the Middle East, whether it's in Asia and in the Pacific, in the Sea of China and in the Sea of Japan with North Korea preparing, making nucle uh, nuclear tests, or whether it's even in the United States. We are starting to leave prophecy. Armando, welcome to the team. Glad to see you here. And I agree with you. I, I, I don't know the dates. I don't think we know specific dates. We can't know the day or the hour, but we can be prepared. We can read the signs of the times and be ready. A BB asks the question, does Xavier have any comments about the devotion to the Holy Face, which was founded in France? How do you feel about the, the Holy Face devotion? Oh, yes. It's very, very, very important. I recommend everyone to study it, to leave the devotion to the Holy Face. But as well, uh, in recommendation to um, Father Michel Rodrigue, uh, I invite everyone, as per the instructions he received from God the Father, uh, to have also a strong devotion for the Holy Family. Uh, on one instance, more than one instance, God the Father informed Father Michel that uh, one um, uh, instrument of protection for the homes will be to have either a photo, a picture, a painting, or a small statuette of the Holy Family and to have it blessed by a priest. It was, he, was, uh, he received a, um, a revelation that indeed those who will do so with faith and devotion and will pray the rosary before it will have their homes, their goods, and their families protected when the time of the cataclysm is to come. Mm. Yeah, we have... We have that for sure. Uh, we, we have a devotion to the Holy Face. We keep the image. Uh, we framed it. We keep it up in front of us. And Sharon, one of our insiders, she took us to a whole other level. She sent us an image of the uh, as a beautiful uh, banner with the actual print of the, uh, the, the, the face of the Lord from the, uh, the Shroud of Turin. And so I put that Shroud in of our oratory <laughs> or here, our home chapel here at the, at the house. And it is amazing. I love looking at it. We pray our, our rosary at night. Specifically, I like to uh, to gaze upon the face of the Lord. Hey, uh, Troy Lockett says, what does Xavier think of Notre Dame restoration work? Does he agree with the choices? Uh, yeah, Notre Dame. What is, like, college you whiz. T to talk about the French Revolution. It's the French government who owns Notre Dame. <laughs> so, like, when is the church going to take back what is hers in France? <laughs> Xavier Reyes, what do you say? Well, uh Actually, it's part of the patrimony of France, uh, the Cathedral of Notre Dame. But it's a place of cult. It uh, also it is managed by the Roman Catholic Church. So yes, when uh, after the fire took place, uh, I think it was in 2019, uh, <laughs> immediately all the masks in France fell because the first and foremost those who appeared first were the Freemasonic lodges of Paris and France who stepped forward and said, "Well, this is a nation of laicity." So this should be, and this is a patrimony of France, it should reflect uh, all the credences and beliefs of the Muslims, that includes the agnostic, the atheist, the Jewish, everyone, including the Freemasons. And they try to do some sort of abomination with a new flesh, the top, what we call the arrow on the top, put new um, mm. uh, stain color uh, windows and... Thank God the Catholic Church um, in France uh, put a stop to this rubbish and uh, had it uh, reconstructed and rebuilt uh, exactly as it was originally. It took uh, quite many years because we had to use a, a great deal of artisanat of the old times and cut wood from uh, major foresters to do exactly what was done before. And by the way, just a brief note, uh, the entire fire incident of uh, uh, Notre Dame is still under investigation. They still do not understand how those big uh, boiseries that are massive uh, could have caught fire. If you put a flame underneath, you will see the flame will go under the, this massive boiserie of wood. No, it doesn't catch. It's too massive. They still are at a loss of understanding. And as a Frenchman, I want to give testimony of this. When the Cathedral of Notre Dame was burning and I was watching live French TV, I, I was not able, like millions, millions of my compatriots. I was not able to keep my eyes dry. You, know? you could see on French TV mm. a massive amount of Arabs on the other side of the Seine River watching the smoke above and the fire flames coming out of Notre Dame, screaming while smiling, um, which means God is great, yeah. which is a scream 
of war of all the Muslim terrorists. That, as long as I'm able to open my eyes, will never, never be forgotten as a Frenchman. Yeah. That was another thing about this book, and I wish I'd, I – it's downstairs in my chapel, so uh, I don't have it with me in my hand. But it's, uh, it's a published by Tan, 1970s, and similar to your book with or quoting all of these prophecies. And there were several prophecies in this book that um, basically talked about the Muslim invasion, that they would have to fight this huge battle with the, with the Muslim uh, hordes coming into – and, you know, in the 1970s, it was the term was the Ottomans, really. But uh, they were coming into Europe in these prophecies and they would have to be repelled. And this is what the French monarch ultimately does. So you've got the Russian element, the Muslim element. You talked about that on the radio side. So and there was a lot of prophecies that talked about that. And we're clearly seeing that. I mean, like th- there is a there is an invasion in, in Europe. There's an invasion in America right now. And there is the, those global elites that would fan the flame of these invasions and perpetuate them towards an end, towards an agenda that we can't just ignore. So we, we we definitely feel like we are headed towards a precipice of some kind. The question is, what, what what is it? When is it? And a lot of people are looking at 2024 with great apprehension, to be sure. A lot of debate going on in the uh, in the chat box about the three days of darkness and when that will happen. I don't know when the three days of darkness will happen. I have no idea. Will it happen this year, some other year? I, I don't know. The only real question, honestly, is are you ready? Are you living in a state of grace? Are you being obedient to your state in life, your vocation? Are you doing what you're supposed to do? Or, or are you hoping that you'll have, there'll be time enough uh, for you to, uh, to repent? You know, maybe, maybe not. That's the thing. You're gambling with your life there and the lives of those are your, your kids, your family members. So might as well get on board now. Um, let's see here. Do, 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 do. I'm going through a lot of these questions. Uh, Nuni asks, will the three days of darkness come after the miracle? Uh, it says, if people do not convert, come back to Jesus and the Catholic Church. Will the three days of darkness come after the miracle? So there's some debate there. Xavier, where are you on that? Well, according to prophecy, uh, there will indeed be the warning. Then there will be a miracle on Pine Hill and possibly on Apparition Hill in Medjugorje. Then there will be the chastisement. The third three days of darkness, according to prophecy through Marie-Julie Jeanne in La Frode, will take place shortly after the liberation of Rome and the placing on the throne of Peter of this angelic pope. Then, according to prophecy, the three days of darkness will take place. And after the three days of darkness, um, the war will cease because of lack of combatants and a new rebirth, a renaissance of sorts, will start spreading throughout the remnant of world society and Roman Catholic Church. Master Baker says, Memento Mori, Gloria Patri, our son lives in Italy and is con- is concerning about the war. Yes, it, the whole war is a very grave concern. Go to confession frequently, live in a state of grace, be joyful, not anxious. Let's not wring no. our hands and just be joyful that we get to live in a state of grace be obedient to God's holy will and accept whatever comes as though it comes from the hand of God. And I guarantee if we share our faith and shine the light of Christ into the darkness, not only do we get to scatter the roaches, but we get to plant seeds in the hearts of many people. And that is what we're called to do. And if God calls us to martyrdom and suffering, well, then rejoice that you get to suffer alongside your master on the cross on Calvary. So wonderful opportunity. Xavier reyes all so grateful to have you back on the show. It was a fun conversation. God bless you and God love you. We're going to put a link to your book today. Thank you very much. Everybody, we'll see you guys back here tomorrow morning. Until then, share us with a friend.